Thomas Ryan Woodside, a filmmaker and Egyptology enthusiast. Recently, Ancient Destinations asked me to accompany them on their tour. We were joined by Sharon Haig, Egyptologist and lawyer. Let's go. Muhammad, our guide, who has worked with Zahi Hawass, Salima Ikram, Bob Breyer, and even Will Smith. Another man was here. Another man was here. Great, I've finished all this. And Mary Allison, the tour director. From exploring deep into tombs. I'm gonna die. <laughs> making new discoveries. On either side of the phones here. There's a change that took place. It's quite common to find these types of things. And taking you to some places never before filmed. Explore the history with us on the maiden expedition of ancient destinations tours. We start our day off with an early morning ride to Memphis. Oh my god, it's Cher! She's smiling. Memphis was Egypt's first ever major capital city, being founded over 5,000 years ago. All that remains is this temple dedicated to the god Ptah, built by Ramses II. Now, because the Egyptians believe that the gods are like human beings, it's 83 tons. 83 tons. Possibly the most beautiful statue of Ramses II is this partially damaged statue found at Memphis. It was destroyed during later times, but the main damage occurred during subsequent flooding and earthquakes, which split the body from its feet. This astonishing red granite statue of Ramses II is so finely carved with exquisite details, down from his bracelets all the way to the fine stripes on his Nemes headdress, even the pleats on his beard and the pleats included on his skirt. On the inner side of Ramsey's leg we can see his 13th son, Meren Ptah, who would be taking over his father's role after his death. No detail was ignored on this statue from the contours of Ramsey's body to the knife which has been stuck in between his belt his pectoral necklace, and even his finely shaped lips which are slightly smiling. 
This special museum just outside of Cairo allows the visitors to get up close and personal to see the exact craftsmanship that took place during ancient times. As you can see, this is Ramses II statue at Memphis. And if you look very carefully, you can see that the ears are pierced. Now there has been a lot of controversy about pierced ears of Tutankhamun and how the mask must have been made for somebody else, perhaps a woman and most probably Nefertiti. But as you can see, many of the pharaohs, even in adulthood, had depictions of themselves shown with pierced ears. The sun, you see the, 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 the circle, that's the sun, and the bird also is the sun. So he's the son of the sun. He's the S-O-N of the S-U-N. Ptah was the main god of Memphis. He was also seen as the god of medicine, healing, craftsmen, and even the shadows. Although not much remains of the ancient city of Memphis, the temple still contains many amazing objects, including the Sphinx, which has no name but it is believed to be Ramses II, although upon closer inspection the facial features resemble those more of Queen Hatshepsut. We're off to Saqqara. Ancient destination tours with Mary. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Hi, and Karen. Hi. Alice, how are you? How's your phone? My phone? No, it's not so good. <laughs> well, it's going to be better than mine. fix it. Curtis can fix it. Remember the scene last year at Giza with him? Of course. <laughs> I have a photo with him. That day, yeah, you were worried. Yeah. That was my mom gave Sharon one like job to do now. It's like please make Keep sure it doesn't trouble. get into jail. Yeah, I, I, I failed. <laughs> Good luck, on the, Sharon. On the first day, I failed. Like the reason why Saqqara is famous for this pyramid because that is the oldest pyramid on the planet. Apart from Abydos, Saqqara is the oldest ancient site used for burials, from pre-dynastic times all the way through until the Ptolemaic period. Many royals and nobles were buried here in their tomb mastabas. Now we can go inside the tomb of Kajimni. Come on, guys. Who will love this? A mastaba is a tomb structure built above the ground and was shaped like the home of the deceased, where their spirit would live for eternity. The scenes depicted in these old kingdom tombs were showing everyday life, from hunting, fishing, farming, to even baking bread. This is the unfinished part of the tomb. And we think that we're about to finish it and maybe the, the, the queen died or the princess died and he stopped. He didn't even put any kind of inscriptions on the walls because death is very much the end of the story. A trip to Saqqara would not be complete without having a look at the world's first ever pyramid built in the third dynasty for Pharaoh Zozo by his architect Imhotep to be used as his tomb. Down very much, under the sand, car, cover, kind of naturally protected. And then we wanted to rebuild apart from it to show the people how they look like. And that's why we put the new one. So you can tell, you can tell the difference between kind of 4,800 years old and about 100 years old. No rooms, it's not it's just stones, it's all solid. Everything we found was just beneath it. Built over 4,800 years ago, this pyramid is under restoration and is still too unsafe for anyone to enter. This pyramid, built out of limestone and mostly mud brick, is lying in complete ruin. However, the inside is absolutely astounding, built for this 5th dynasty ruler called Pharaoh Unas. Unas pyramid is one of the best. Sharon, what are we doing? We're discovering too. You promised me last time you're going to drag me into a tomb. Look what you're doing. You're taking me in a pyramid. This tomb was the first ever to be inscribed with texts from several Egyptian religious books, including the Book of the Dead. The alabaster walls of this burial chamber have had their texts painted to bring them back to life, which will help Pharaoh Unas reach the afterlife. 
and for the Egyptians, death was just as important as life. This tomb is very mysterious. It's at Saqqara. We don't know much about it. Let's go. Many discoveries are still to be made, including this tomb at Saqqara, which Sharon and I thought we should have a closer look at as it was unexcavated. Alright, here we go. It's a revered one. Osiris at Jeddu or Abydos. Find out what, as you can see. And if you look in there, you can see there's a lot more to discover. This appears to be the entrance of a noble's tomb with a shaft going straight down and might lead to many treasures. Revealed one on the top, I think. This is the one. This is the one known, yeah, no one, no one, by Osiris. Osiris. And then the Lord of Abydos should be here. And then there's Jeddu, so yes, the Lord yes. of Abydos. Abydos, so you can see the city here. That little group is Jeddu, and then, and the then something by the king also. I think also known by the king as well. It's the fake door, the false door for this particular tomb. As you can see, it's unexcavated and it still needs a lot of work. You need to get a group here to do that. And you can see the titles of the owner, his name and the owner here. After we had our Howard Carter moment, we decided to go for lunch. This is one of my favourite places. It's a great place to have lunch. It's got everything that you want. So come inside. Just outside of Cairo, Saqqara is one of the few places that still allow you to feel what it would have been like to live in ancient times. The Giza Plateau in Cairo is probably the most famous site in all of Egypt, containing the world's most famous pyramid. Yeah, this is the largest pyramid on the planet. When this pyramid was built, I mean, it was the largest building on the planet. So, I mean, you're talking about 4,600 years ago. The mountain of stone, known as the Great Pyramid, took around 22 years to build. The Great Pyramid was built in the 4th dynasty for Pharaoh Khufu. Mary, Sharon. Sharon, we were here last year together, exactly the same time, and you asked me to come inside the pyramid with you, and I said no. I have a phobia of going inside there, but we had a deal last time that if we come back together, we're going inside together. You're going to drag me in by my hair. We'll take you inside, and I think we'll be able to experience it all that time. Okay, but if it falls in on me, I told you so. Good. Hundred, man. Are you going inside? Yeah. Up the steep descent into the Great Pyramid. This might be the last time you ever see me. Oh, we're inside the Great Pyramid. We're going up. Oh, look at the. It's so deep. Oh. And there's Sharon going. Up. Okay, I'm gonna die. Sharon, you've taken me to the top of the pyramid. We're about to go into the chamber. Yes, that's right, Curtis. Have I died yet? No, you haven't. And Karen's here too. We're not quite sure about Karen. Look where we came from. All the way from down there. Oh my god. Let's go in and there are little breaks. Okay, Let's go into the go chamber. In. See you in a bit, guys. Okay, so I didn't die. Next, we were to marvel at an incredible discovery made at the base of the pyramid. You know that uh, Jadepra's Hattush name was found in here, showing that he was in actual fact a dutiful son rather than the scapegoat or black sheep of his family. This ship was buried at the base of Khufu's pyramid by his son, Jadepra, who would later become pharaoh. It was buried as an offering for the king to be able to go on his solo journey into the afterlife. No nails were used in the manufacturing of this ship. It was all done by tying it together with ropes. Egypt, a land filled with many mysteries, and our last stop is one of Egypt's most mysterious and iconic monuments. But before that, we had a little visit to the Valley Temple built by Pharaoh Khafra. This mortuary temple contained many statues of Pharaoh Khafra, which are still visible in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Made from red granite, and the floor made from alabaster. It is absolutely beautiful. It's like the back of some of those other tombs we saw. Any more discoveries? The 
Great Sphinx of Giza. Nobody is actually quite sure whose face is depicted on the Sphinx. However, it is my opinion that it depicts Pharaoh Khafra. Carved out of the solid limestone mound, the Sphinx has been protecting this ancient burial site for thousands of years. Ancient Thebes, now known as Luxor, is home to Egypt's largest temple, Karnak. Connecting the two main temples of Luxor and Karnak is the Sphinx Avenue, over four kilometers long. Hundreds of Sphinxes line the avenue, and underneath the chin of the Sphinx is Ramses II. Karnak's construction was started at the end of the Old Kingdom, and was extended by every pharaoh, but mostly the 19th dynasty, the family of Ramses II. This side chapel was built by Ramses' father, Seti I, and was dedicated to Amun-Ra. On the walls, we see the ceremonial boat carrying the statue of the creator god, Amun, which will connect him from Karnak to Luxor. This wall actually lists Ramses' family line from his grandfather Ramses I, Seti I, all the way to Seti II. This defaced sphinx was originally Tutankhamun. Almost every single image of Tutankhamun's family was erased due to the religious belief of King Tut's father, Akhenaten. Arguably the most famous name from Egypt's history is King Tut, and luckily there are still a few depictions of him. Many pharaohs had statues' names changed, including Pharaoh Petagen. He had this statue of Ramses II altered to his own name. However, Unfortunately for him, he left the name of Nefertari, Ramses' wife, at his knee, and that is how we know who this statue actually depicts. Karnak was dedicated to Amun-Ra, and the Egyptians believed in their religion that he was their creator. This is one of the most beautiful statues here of Tutankhamun and Amun. Of course it says Ramses the Great. At the bottom you can see his cartouches, both the name and coronation name. Sumatra, Sitpenra, Ramses, beloved of Amun. So is yet another statue that has been commandeered by Ramses the Great. They believed that Amun created himself and then his wife Mut. Following that, they had their son Hans, and then he created the earth over the next seven days. The temples were known as the home of the gods, and Amun was said to live inside Karnak. The colonnaded hall, started by Seti I and finished by Ramses II, is still known as the world's largest ancient religious site. What we're seeing here is these cartouches on the, the columns, and it's very interesting because they've been, this is not first condition, they've been changed. You can see Amun used to be here, you can actually see the outline of his crown and everything, with Mark, but someone has come along, they've hacked out. Ra, they've, they've chiseled out Ra, and they've changed Amun to Heka, which is ruler. So this is ruler of Maat, which is justice, so Heka, Maat, something, it's gone here, we don't know. But this is very interesting, on either side of the columns here, there's a change that took place. What changes that? We don't know. Egypt had many invasions after the 19th dynasty, which saw mass devastation up until the Coptic times. The statue of Seti II still stands headless. We're approaching the obelisks, twin obelisks, of a father and a daughter. So the first obelisk belongs to Tutmosis I, and it is part of the pair. The second lot of obelisks, Hatshepsut, there's only one standing, the other one is lying down further along. In the 18th dynasty, when her husband died, her stepson was far too young to take the throne, and Queen Hatshepsut made herself into a pharaoh. She is still known as one of Egypt's strongest rulers. However, when her stepson, Tutmosis III, became king, he destroyed many of her monuments. As you can see, it shows Amun blessing Hatshepsut as king, so she's sovereign now of Egypt. So you can see, there's a 
perfectly preserved. Until recently, there was actually a sound very much like a gong sound throughout this obelisk. Um, that doesn't occur anymore. So that's the fallen obelisk right there. King Tut's father, Akhenaten, also had a hand in destroying many of Egypt's monuments that bared the name of Amun, as he believed in only one god, Aten. The inner sanctuary of Karnak held a golden statue of Amun, and only the high priest and the pharaoh were allowed to enter to worship the god. In 332 BC, after entering this sanctuary, Alexander the Great sought out the oracle where he was proclaimed to be the son of Amun and crowned pharaoh. This temple extension, beautifully preserved, was built by one of Egypt's most prolific warriors, Tutmosis III. Stepson of Hatshepsut, the great queen pharaoh, and his temple in Karnak still has an enormous amount of colour on it. It was actually appropriated by the Christians and there has been a lot of defacement. However, it's still a wonderful place in which to come. If you look close enough, you can even see the remnants of paintings made by the Coptics of Christian saints. The pillars of the Tutmosis Temple at Karnak are designed very differently. They were made to look like the tents which he would take when he was out at battle. Karnak was extended by many pharaohs, but here, underneath a column, we can see one of the original foundation stones laid down in the Old Kingdom. The carving on the wall is so beautiful, so pretty. The pharaoh sitting on the throne, you see how beautiful he is, how big he is. And then beneath him, we have something very special. We have actually two flowers, lotus flower and papyrus. And both of them represent Upper and Lower Egypt in ancient time. So when they put them together, it means that the Pharaoh himself, by the help of the god, controlling Upper and Lower Egypt. This scarab statue for Tut's grandfather, Amenhotep III, is meant to bring good luck for visitors who walk around it. In my opinion, the best time to visit Luxor Temple is in the evening when you can feel the magic at its full force. Lining each entrance to Luxor Temple are the enormous statues of none other than Ramses II. And gazing upon these statues, you can see why he's known as Ramses the Great. At Luxor Temple, they have newly erected this statue of Ramses II. For a very long time he didn't have a body, but now he's been erected on his body and his head is here with his other statues looking out at the visitors, welcoming everybody to Egypt. And Ramses really does welcome everyone into his temple. Once this rubble is repaired, the final statue of Ramses will be placed at the entrance once again. Now, unlike Karnak Temple, Luxor was dedicated not to religious roles, but was in part dedicated to worshipping the role of the Pharaoh. Once a year, a grand festival would take place, where the Pharaoh would walk with the statue of Amun and connect with the Temple of Luxor. This event would have the entire population of Thebes lining the avenue of the Sphinxes to have a glimpse at this amazing occasion. Ramses had over 100 wives, but the love of his life, Nefertari, is here at Luxor, standing by his knee, helping him rule the country. Hi, Curtis. Hi. <laughs> How are you enjoying Karnak? I'm well, loving it. Looks it. So I... nice. <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak because I'm literally looking at the most beautiful statue ever, Ramses and Nefertari. At the back of these statues we can see Sesat and Thoth writing down Ramses's legacy. Over the years, Luxor Temple played host to many religions, including the Christians who built a church here. We even have a depiction of Jesus on the walls. There is also a mosque that was made here, built from the same stone used to make Luxor Temple. Whomever possessed these temples truly 
was all-powerful. Oh my God, Luxor Temple at night is so beautiful. This is the most beautiful place. You must come see this. Today's adventure starts by an early morning ride across the Nile to the west bank of Luxor. Let's go see the Colossi of Memnon. Colossi of Memnon, which most of you know is basically represents Amenhotep III, grandfather to Tutankhamun, also father to Akhenaten, the first monotheist in history. So here we have two enormous statues of Amenhotep. They are basically standing at the front of a temple, which is now being excavated. The temple was hidden under the earth for a very long time, and it was flooded. They basically had to pump the water out, and they're excavating dozens and dozens of monuments in the background, which will be available for visitors to come and see in the future. Amenhotep III was one of Egypt's most wealthiest pharaohs, having ruled very diplomatically, having fought no battles. And by his side was his ever-powerful wife, Queen T. Many of the ancient dignitaries preferred to converse directly with T, rather than Amenhotep. However, three generations before Amenhotep III came Queen Hatshepsut within the 18th family dynasty. 3,800 years ago, this exceptional temple would have looked very different, lined with canals and exotic plants and trees collected by her stepson Tutmosis III. Lining the cliffs are tombs for army warriors. We're at Hatshepsut's temple. She was queen who reigned around the 15th century BC. And she reigned as a king, not as a queen, but as sole sovereign, very much like Queen Elizabeth I. And this is a beautiful temple. It's so modern, it looks Greek, perhaps. I think it almost looks fascist in the architecture. And perfect columns, perfect alignment, several terraces. It's a fantastic place to come to, and you must come here when you come to Egypt. Deir al-Bakhri, or the Egyptian name Jezer Jezeru, means the most holy of holy places. The lower levels are dedicated to Hathor and Anubis. And if you come with me, you might see a nice detail in the Anubis chapel. Up here is a falcon, lovely falcon, and you might recognize it because Howard Carter himself painted this, and there is still a painting extant of this falcon by Hal Carter, discoverer of Tutankhamun's tomb. The opposite chapel is dedicated to Hathor in the form of the cow, the symbol of love and motherhood. And standing above is Hatshepsut in the form of Osiris. Hathor had many forms, including this of a front-facing woman with the ears of a cow, Hatshepsut, in full pharaonic dress, is shown feeding the cow goddess. Hatshepsut journeyed far and wide, including Punt. She went there by sea and was gifted with animals, perfumes and exotic plants. Recently restored, we were allowed access to enter the innermost sanctuary, the most holy place of Hatshepsut's temple. In here would have been a golden statue of Hatshepsut's patron god. Hi, how are you, Curtis? I'm very happy because this is my first time coming into the sanctuary, and the colors are just so incredible to look at. And Hatshepsut with her blue and yellow nemes, and Hapi with his full color. Full color indeed. Being closed off from wind and sun, the colors have been beautifully preserved. However, many of them were blackened out when Coptics used this as a hideaway. 
Eventually, Thutmosis III, Hatshepsut's stepson, took his rightful place as Pharaoh of Egypt. He then sought revenge and removed the names of Hatshepsut from her monuments. Her name meant the foremost of noble women, and this was recognized by Ramses II, who restored many of Hatshepsut's monuments. A little known fact is that right over here is the temple on which it was based, that of Mentehotep. And as you can see, although it is in rubble, that is actually the first temple with exactly the same architecture, or at least similar architecture, on which Hatshepsut was based. So how are you feeling, Auntie City? I'm feeling hot. Feeling hot? Yes. I'm very annoyed that you had your cartridge passed it over mine and in the most sanctuary. You know, that I should, everything I did for you. Well, you know, you shouldn't have been there in the first place. I was doing a good thing. You wouldn't be there unless it was me. Well, if you put it that way, maybe. Think about it. Think about it. Yeah. I'll try. Thanks, Auntie City. So jackals love to go into burials, so they you know, would dig up the dead bodies and they'd eat them. While Sharon voluntarily gave us a lecture in the bus, we headed over to the Land of the Dead, the most famous of all burial sites in the world, where many of Egypt's pharaohs were buried. The Valley of the Kings. 63 royal tombs were here, including some for Egypt's most powerful kings. In vivid colour on the ceiling is the goddess Nut, who is swallowing the sun which will pass through her body for 12 hours of the night to be reborn in the morning. This was symbolising the fact that Ramses IV would also be doing the same, being reborn each day. In the centre of the room is Ramses IV's solid red granite sarcophagus. But it's Amun-Ra in the form of the Amduat version of Amun-Ra. So that's why he's got a ram's head. It's the, it's the underworld. Amduat or underworld. So that's the underworld version of amun Many of the gods had various forms and were depicted helping the pharaoh in the next life. I have a beautiful necklace from Curtis, which represents the Hecate and Shu. It's a combination of the gods, which you can see reflected in the sky. Beautiful ceiling showing moat being supported by the god Shu. The texts in the tomb were there to help the pharaoh journey into the afterlife and were an account of his accomplishments which would be reflected towards the gods. Evidence of graffiti from the Greeks can be found inside this tomb from when they used it as a camp 3,400 years after the death of Ramses IV. The entire tomb was one long guidebook for the pharaoh on how to please the gods and defeat the demons to enter the afterlife. At the entrance, the pharaoh is greeting Ra, who will allow him to board his solar barge to begin his journey. One of the best decorated tombs is that for the pharaoh who defeated the sea peoples and who was murdered by his harem. This is the tomb of Ramses III. It's my first time in here. I'm so excited to see it. It's so beautiful. I've heard. Let's go show you. The attention to detail and the vividness of the colours against the white walls will take your breath away.
The excessive use of blue in the tomb shows Ramses' vast wealth, and he is shown in his tomb thanking the gods for just that. Presenting himself as a mighty pharaoh, he is asking Anubis to help him into the next life. The most beautiful face in the tomb is Ptah, the god of the shadows, medicine, and craftsmen, shown green as he has been mummified and lives in the next world. Shown in this highly detailed carving at the entrance of his tomb, Ramses III is greeting Ra, the sun god, to begin his journey to the afterlife. He was to become one with Ra, and rise each morning with the sun. The ceiling is decorated with blue and gold stars representing the night sky. This tomb is reflectant of Ramses III's temple at Medinet Habu, meaning Temple of the Snake. We will visit it in the coming days, and the color and detail will astound you. We're in the tomb of Merenptah, visiting the son of Ramses the Great, who became Pharaoh of Egypt after his father's death. As you can see, there's wonderful painting and fine relief, and this is very characteristic of the 19th dynasty. It's a very steep climb and a very steep descent into the tomb, so come on and join me. And as you can see, there's a beautiful outline of Nut, goddess of the sky. We're further down in the tomb, and the painting is exquisite. Have a look at the colours, especially as you move around. Meren Ptah, meaning the powerful one of the god Ptah, definitely tried to live up to the standards of his father, Ramses II. The 19th dynasty can pride themselves on the detail in their tombs, as it is unlike any other you will experience throughout Egypt. One of the biggest tombs in the Valley of the Kings, it is based on the same design as his grandfather, Seti I, and his father, Ramses II's tomb. The stone sarcophagus of Meren Ptah bears a strong family resemblance to those of his father, Ramses II's statues. I wonder how the pharaohs would feel knowing that thousands of people visit their tomb each day. Started in the late 1800s, the Nile cruise is one of Egypt's most historic attractions, and guess what? We are starting our three-day journey down the Nile towards Aswan. The Nile cruise gives us unparalleled vistas of how ancient life would have been 7,000 years ago throughout this land. A lot has changed throughout Egypt's history, but somehow, the beauty has remained unchanged. This morning at Edfu here, 
as you can see in the background, there's a lovely vista of the Nile. It's about six o'clock in the morning. We'll be off to <coughs> Edfu. We disembark our Nile cruise early in the morning in the small town of Edfu to visit the Temple of the Falcon, Horus. We're talking about head dryers. We're talking about head dryers, Edfu. but uh, we are, we're here at Edfu, uh, Ptolemaic Temple. So let's go see. Uh, there's a very nice statue of Horus with uh, Caesar or Caesarian, it's debatable. But uh, let's go talk with the group. Maybe uh, Sharon will have some answers for us. This temple is believed to have been completed during the Greek Ptolemaic dynasties. As you know, it is the temple which was at least finished by Cleopatra VII. She actually consorted with the great Roman Caesar. And this is a depiction of Caesar as Horus, because you have to remember that in Egyptian law, they were married. And this here is Caesarion, the child of Caesar and Cleopatra. A small inscription on the inside of the temple leads us to believe that this was started in the New Kingdom by Horemheb or Ramses I. Edfu Temple is one of the best preserved temples because up until the 1800s it was buried under desert sand and the desert sand helped preserve the reliefs and actually when you're here you get a feeling of what it would have been like because this is one of the most complete temples that you will ever see so let's go inside and show ceremonial boat which contained the golden statue of Horus. Once a year the priests would carry the boat containing the statue of Horus to Dendera, connecting him with his consort Hathor. This would recreate the act of where Hathor reconstructed the eye of Horus after the battle against Seth. by both the Christians and the Egyptians. So you can see evidence of Christianity as well as the old religion. For areas that were too high for the Christians to reach to hack out the Egyptian gods, they blacked out with soot to obscure the old religion from their view. On the columns we can see Ptolemy VI engaging in building the temple. Here he's shown lifting two obelisks, symbolically showing the completion of the project. See one goddess on the right, one goddess on the left. Look at the crowns. Upper Egypt crown, lower Egypt crown. So they are the two local gods, goddesses from Upper and Lower Egypt, put the crown on the head of the pharaoh. I assume that that happened. It happened in all temples. We have to put the crown on top of the head of the king. As you know, Champollion was the discoverer of hieroglyphs. And he was at a start. Yeah. And he basically took the cartouches of Ptolemy and Cleopatra. So we are here with those very same names. So Cleopatra? Well, the reason he could translate it was because it was in Greek, and the Greek helped to translate into hieroglyphics. So what we've got here is Ptolemyos. So Ptolemyos, which is a Greek name, but now we know him as just Ptolemy. And then it says living forever connected with Ptah. And then Sharon, what as it says here, he is one. Ra, which means 
he's the son of Ra. Yeah. So he's a god. And this is his coronation name, which is quite a long name. And then you have the Sufi, which means that he is the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. Mesut? With tea. So that little loaf of bread is a tea. So whenever you see that, remember there's a tea somewhere in that name. You might not notice it immediately, but the hieroglyphics of the Ptolemies are quite different from all the other Egyptian carvings. They're more rounded and embossed than ever before. Egypt had a very strong appeal to the Greeks. Unlike conquerors who would go into other countries and change the religion, the religion ended up changing the Greeks. They adopted many of the customs and sometimes even added their own spin on things. You can see Thoth everywhere. Thoth is a god of Friday. I think this is one of the best Thoth I've ever seen. Look how beautiful it is. What we see here is another list of kings showing all the kings of Egypt stretching from the end of the pylon to the side. And as we go on, it ends here with Cleopatra. Cleopatra is a sick and is waiting, I believe last year, is waiting for my cartouche. And you know what? I brought my cartouche with this year, and I'm going to put it in a cartouche. So, go look. This is where the Egyptians believed a monumental battle took place between two gods. The battle between good and evil, Horus and Set, takes place in this temple. As you can see, Horus is up there, snaring a very tiny set, so evil has been diminished. As we leave Edfu, we sail down the river past Jebel Silsila, where our friends John and Maria are excavating at the moment and making incredible discoveries. And in the evening, we dock at the Temple of the Crocodile. Another Ptolemaic temple, this time dedicated to the god Sobek, who is in charge of healing, protection, and the water of the Nile. Dedicated in part also to the god Horus, this temple is used almost like a hospital to treat ailments of the skin and the eyes. Mambo, even though it is a very ancient temple and has been excavated many times, there are still excavations going on. It's quite common to find these types of things, pottery shards, at the site. Even though this temple of the Ptolemies is over 2,000 years old, there is still more being discovered here each day. As Sharon was saying, you can see all the wheelbarrows and everything here from the excavations that are still happening at this ancient site. There's always more to find in Egypt, so let's keep exploring. The Egyptian building techniques were so strong that not even earthquakes could destroy this temple, only suffering minor damage. This is the butterfly clan holding the bricks together at the Mombo. <laughs> The back of the temple is the best preserved, showing many of the gods, including the consort of Sobek, Sekhmet, the fierce lioness-headed goddess, who would give the pharaoh strength in war. And here we see the patron god of this temple, the crocodile, Sobek, receiving offerings from the priests and the people. Several crocodiles were housed and worshipped in this temple, and even mummified like the kings. At Kamomo there are several details which are very interesting and you can always find more. Over here you can see there's an attempt to basically outline toes. They look a little bit like fingers but it's a big contrast to the two left feet that we often see in Egyptian portraiture. This temple may have been built by the Greeks but it is still incredibly Egyptian.
here we see the pharaoh's pet lion eating the hands of the enemies, and as the lion symbolized sunset, we decided, since it was sunset, to head back to the ship. One cannot describe the feeling you get when watching the sunset over the Nile. It is quite unlike anything you would have ever experienced. The splendors of Egypt, both ancient and modern, are timeless. Day 5 of our expedition starts with an early morning ride down the vast expanses of the southern Egyptian desert to the southernmost point of Egypt on the border with Sudan to see the giant monuments of one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs. Ramses II had these two wondrous temples carved right out of the mountains of stone. It's amazing because there's nothing else like it. It's a uh, it's beautiful temple on the outside, it's colossal and uh, it's even better on the inside. The first and the largest of the temples at Abu Simbel have four statues of Ramses II seated on the throne of power and at his knee is his wife Nefertari. The entrance is flanked by Hapi, who is tying Egypt together, symbolizing Ramses' rule of Upper and Lower Egypt. The first hallway is lined with statues of Ramses, and on the ceiling the goddess Nekbet, symbolizing that this hallway is pure. On the inside is one of Ramses' most notable battles, the Battle of Kadesh. I want to show you here, this is probably one of the most important things of Abu Simbel. It is the Battle of Kadesh. Here is Ramses on his chariot, shooting his bow and arrow at the enemies, and you can see he's got another person on the chariot with him. So uh, it's, it's two people per chariot. And some of us like to speculate that this is probably the biggest battle in ancient history. 20,000 horses on the Egyptian side and 20,000 horses on the Hittite side. Approximately 80,000 men. But isn't it just incredible? And you can see the color on him still. The skin, the blue on the crown. And that crown, Karen, is called the Kepresh crown. The Kepresh crown was only worn during very special times and war. So if you see that, you know something important is happening. The horse is amazing. You can tell it's a male horse. <laughs> and the horse is actually trampling on its enemies. You can see it here. Let me show you this. See this, Karen? This is Kadesh. And that's the fortress. And here are the people. They're, they're frightened of Ramses. They're bowing down. And here, the horse is about to trample this man. And notice how small he makes his enemies and how big Ramses is. They do this all the time in Egyptian art, not just Ramses. But this will show that he is the stronger one. So that's what this is about. And then up there, he's worshipping all of the gods, thanking them. And there he is thanking Amun. He's saying to Amun, thank you for giving me the strength to fight my battles. And here is the reward I'm giving you from Kadesh. He's handing it over to the hidden god. Abu Simbel is a giant monument to Ramses' battle at Kadesh, where we see him fighting directly against the enemies. The scenes from Kadesh would be repeated on almost every temple Ramses built.
Inside Abu Simbel are various walls depicting exactly what happened during the Battle of Kadesh. We see the king on his chariot with his soldiers, surrounding the city shooting arrows at the Hittites. While they were shooting, they ran away, reloading to come back and refire again. And finally, we see Ramses on the throne of Egypt, receiving gifts from officials of the Hittites. Years after the Battle of Kadesh, Ramses and the ruler of Kadesh signed a peace treaty, the first of its kind, but many do not know that this idea was sprung from the mind of Ramses' principal wife, Nefertari. of his life would be Nefertari. They met when they were still teenagers, before Ramses became king. In the inner sanctuary of Abu Simbel is one of the most beautiful images I've seen. It's Ramses shown as a young prince with Nefertari. She's holding him on the arm and she's pulling him from behind his head, she's pulling him closer, which would suggest that she's about to kiss him. And by seeing this, this lets you know just how much they were in love. Twice a year, the three statues of the inner sanctuary are illuminated of Ra, Amun, Ramses himself, and the god of the shadows, Ptah. The second temple is dedicated to Ramses' greatest love, Nefertari. In various scenes in this temple, we can see Nefertari giving offerings directly to the goddess Hathor, invoking love and happiness into her and her husband's life. The inner hallway is lined with the faces of Hathor on each column. We know that Ramses was born on the border of Israel and Egypt in the city of Avaris and had red hair. However, as for Nefertari, we're not sure of her parentage. However, evidence from her tomb suggests she may have been related to Pharaoh I, who is the possible father of Nefertiti. Nefertari means the most beautiful of all, and her images evoke this immensely. Inside Nefertari's temple, which is the most beautiful temple that I will symbolize in my opinion, we have the innermost sanctuary, where we have a little bird flying in with its babies, cute. That's, that's love right there. But love here is, about, is abundant. It's Hathor, the cow goddess, and she is here with Nefertari in front of her. And on the side, not in a statue, in a carving, is Ramses II worshipping Hathor and his wife, Nefertari. Now, Ramses is shown here, very clearly, worshipping his wife. No other king worshipped his wife. 
To the right is Ramses seated, ruling Egypt equally, showing how important she was. The sad part of the story is that Nefertari never got to see her temple being finished as she died around the age of 30, leaving Ramses' life changed forever. The ancient Greeks used to say that this country could not exist without the elegant river that runs through it. Egypt was the gift of the Nile. And for day six, our crews had docked in Aswan. So, Sharon? Yes, Curtis? Do you know where we're going today? Philae Temple. Mm, it's on the island. It's uh, really beautiful. So. Yes, it's one of my favorite temples, Curtis. <laughs> well, why, why don't we stop talking and get on the boat and go? Sounds good. Aswan markets are unique, selling an eclectic array of Egyptian and Nubian art. Philae Temple is located on an island in the middle of the Nile, and one must take a boat to get there, making for a splendid and scenic journey. I personally like to refer to this temple as the Green Temple. Philae Temple is primarily a Greek Ptolemaic temple dedicated to the Egyptian goddess Isis. However, smaller sections are dedicated to various gods, including this section dedicated to Hathor. Although we know this temple to be built by the Ptolemies, the smaller section was built by Pharaoh Nectanebo of the 29th dynasty in 380 BC. From far, you cannot see the devastation, but up close, you can see where every Pharaoh, Queen, and Egyptian god's face was hacked out systematically. Philae Temple definitely is extremely beautiful, but it's very sad to think of its history. It was used as a refuge by the Coptics, it was also used as a refuge by the Egyptians. They came here to hide away in the late period when Christianity was taking over and the Egyptian religion was being whittled out. And what's sad is you notice on all the, two, on all the walls here, everything has been chiseled out. So it's very sad, but it's sad and beautiful at the same time. Inside, we see Isis, who has given birth to baby Horus, being supported by the other gods. The story goes that Osiris, the husband of Isis, was killed by their brother Seth and chopped up into 13 pieces. Isis flew across the country and reconnected her husband's body parts, and then she became pregnant from his spirit, giving birth to Horus, the protector of the pharaohs. The story of Isis and Osiris are spread throughout this temple, and also the images of the Ptolemies. Including possibly the most famous Ptolemy, Cleopatra VII. And she was to become the final pharaoh of Egypt. Above, we see a very Greek image of an Egyptian goddess, Merit Sega, she who loves silence, usually seen as a cobra, now with a cobra on her head. After the death of Cleo, the Egyptians faced extinction by the hands of the Christians. They hid away at Philae for years, but when the Christians found them and refused to convert, they were executed. On the 24th of August, 394 AD, this man wrote the last Egyptian hieroglyphic, Egypt was over. In this particular part of the temple at Philae, you can see the sign, which means that they're adoring the king. So it is actually a sign to stand here and worship the king. It's a, a sign for prayer. This small chapel was dedicated to Bess, the god of protecting children and, strangely, sex. In the 1960s, the entire Philae temple complex was moved to protect it from flooding from the newly constructed Aswan Dam.
always got a bracelet from here. Isn't it nice? It's got little Nubian flowers. It's so cute. Even though their history has been destroyed, we can still feel their presence here today. This is the stone quarry in Aswan, where many stones were hewn out of the rock to be made into the monuments that we see today at Karnak and Luxor Temple. Here we find the world's largest obelisk. Although unfinished, it is still massive to marvel at. It's astonishing to think that as Sharon is demonstrating, the rocks here were quarried out by hand with these dolerite pounders. Although there is no name, we have strong evidence that proves that this belonged to Queen Hatshepsut. Due to the rock splitting, this obelisk was abandoned. That was supposed to be a statue, the whole thing, the whole thing. And also for some reason they stopped. They did not want to continue. I think maybe the pharaoh died. Someone came from a far distance and said, guys, put down the tools. <laughs> King is dead. You're not paid. So that's why they did not finish it. Now, let's get down. It's beautiful. It's probably Ramses. <laughs> two steps, guys. You see the size of each one. Like a man was here, another man was here, another man was here. They hold the bounders, the dollar right, they chisel down. And then they made that great tunnel beneath the base of stone, and they're about to quarry it all. See it? And that's how they did it. They just. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All day long, all day long. And it works, still work. As you can see, Curtis, this is how they were the sculptured the underneath or the underside of the great obelisk, the great unfinished obelisk of Hatshepsut. The Egyptian workmen were paid well and worked for eight days in the week and had three days off after. And now it's time for our off day. And what else is more relaxing than a beautiful ride down the Nile on a felucca, watching the ancient wonders of Aswan go by like no time has passed. late afternoon, Aswan, and this is a beautiful way to spend the afternoon. Just look at the view, and I highly recommend it, only on ancient destination tours. We're looking at this coastline that pretty much shows us what it must have looked like in ancient times. I feel that it's like thousands of years ago. High on the hill is the mausoleum of Aga Khan, built in 1957. Aswan is known as the home and the birthplace of the god of the Nile, Hapi. I always say this, but I believe that Aswan is the most beautiful city in Egypt and if you have the opportunity to come here and come on a felucca you're transported back thousands of years ago to how they used to live you have to do it it's just incredible action as you can see in the background over there is the old cataract hotel As you can see in the background, there is the old cataract hotel made very famous by Devil and Nile Agatha Christie. He's <laughs> <laughs> trying not to do that again. As you can see in the background, the old cataract hotel. As you can see in the background, we have the old cataract hotel made famous in Agatha Christie's Death on the Nile.
One of the most iconic films of all time, Death on the Nile, was inspired by this hotel and the city of Aswan when Agatha Christie stayed here on her Nile cruise. Known as the Temple of Elephantine, this temple was built on an island in the middle of the Nile. The main pharaohs that built at this temple complex were Pharaoh Sesostris, Tutmosis, Ramses II, and Pharaoh Zomtik III. That's the Nilometer behind us. The Nilometer was constructed to measure the level of the Nile to predict the flood seasons. Many pharaohs left their mark on the rocks surrounding this area, including Amenhotep III, the grandfather of King Tut. Underneath the cartouche of Amenhotep appears to be a statue of a baboon, symbolizing the god Thoth, who would greet the sun as it rose every day. Hey y'all, we're here at the temple of Amun Ray at Medinet Habu. At Medinet Habu. Yeah, so let's go have a look, y'all. <laughs> she's embarrassed because actually she's American. Do an English accent. Do a Kiwi accent. Now, um, Sharon, you have to enunciate. You have to enunciate and should be. You are. I'm doing full enunciation and look at my ears. <laughs> After a day off sailing up the Nile, we once again reached Luxor. On the top also, remember? Okay. The holes where they hang the flags of the banners. On the West Bank, this is Medinet Habu, one of Egypt's most colorful temples. Sekhmet guards the entrance. This temple is, was created by Ramses III. He's one of Egypt's most powerful pharaohs, although not related to Ramses II. However, Ramses III did try to emulate Ramses II by building on such a grand scale and making his name so deep in the walls. And just like Ramses, he surrounded this inner court with statues of himself with his children. Let's go look closer. It was here that Ramses III was murdered when one of the feuding wives in his harem snuck a snake into his bedroom. However, it took almost 10 days for the venom to kill the king, and this gave him enough time to seek justice. Here at Medinet Habu in Luxor, we can see these magnificent statues of Ramses III. He was basically slain by his harem, or at least some people in his harem, and these statues will probably be familiar with some of you because they appeared in a James Bond movie, The Spy Who Loved Me. The most well-preserved temple colors can be found at Medinet Habu, the blue showing the vast amount of wealth that Ramses III acquired. Again on the ceiling, we see Nekbet, showing that this is a pure temple. And on either side of the pylon, we see Ramses III giving offerings to the ultimate god, Amun. When looking at the walls of a temple, you must remember that these are not just images of art, but it is a story being told for eternity. The Egyptians believed if you carved your name into stone, it would last for forever. The creator god Amu and his wife Mut are shown repeatedly throughout this temple, with Ramses III giving offerings directly to them, thanking them for a prosperous reign. The ancient Egyptians had a plethora of gods, and each one had a defined role based on the qualities they portrayed. Muhammad, right there. You don't see that? Oh, okay. That's so clear. <laughs> Why you guys to... take me to these places? Okay. <laughs> In the inner court, we see Ramses III celebrating his jubilee. He's being carried by all of his princes in a royal throne, accompanied by the goddess Ma'at, showing that he has brought balance to Egypt. Truly a marvel of ancient architecture. However, this temple was not entirely built by Ramses III. It was built a lot earlier by Amenhotep III. The back section 
was what was started by the grandfather of Tutankhamun. In a small shrine is a decapitated statue made out of white alabaster, depicting Amenhotep III as Ptah. Another chapel for another god, and this god is super important for the Egyptian. This is very much the god of the whole Egyptian, the god of the craftsmanship. From the biggest man in Egypt to the smallest one, the king and the smallest one, we all loved him, we all considered him great. That's a little bit chapel, and it has just a wonderful piece of alabaster. The same the piece for God, Ptah, one of the most important gods in ancient Egypt. Below, we can still see the name of Amenhotep. This was possibly destroyed by his son, Akhenaten. In ancient Egypt, the Papuans were very connected with the god Ra, the god of the sun, and maybe because they wake up early, you know, earlier than any other one, and they do a lot of noise, oh, oh, and they thought that this is, they're greeting the sun. So usually they connect the baboons with the sun. Baboons were seen as connected to the Ibis god Thoth, the god of writing and intelligence, and were used to help spread his wisdom. You feel that it's not easy, it's too difficult. How you can polish such a stone and make it that perfect? You put your hand on it and you like remember your kitchen. The Ankh represents eternal life and Ramses built this temple to ensure he would live for forever. Hidden at the side of the Valley of the Kings is Deir al Medina, or better known as the Workman's Village, where uh, at the Workman's Village, Deir al Medina where the workmen lived. These are the workmen for the New Kingdom pharaohs. So all the tombs that you see in the Valley of the Kings have been built by the people who lived here. And their tombs are up there, which are beautifully painted. Cher, where are we going? Into the tomb. On their days off, the workmen helped each other build these elaborate tombs, not for kings, but for themselves. Hey Karen. Yes. What did you think of the Tomb of the Nobles? Unbelievable. Gorgeous. I it was a setup. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like yesterday. Yes. And now, um, we go up. Many tombs were built here, including the tomb of Senefa. This tomb was actually built as a family mausoleum where each member would be buried upon their departure of this world. Sharon, this is another tomb for a noble, mm -hmm. one of the artists from Daryl Medina. And isn't it just incredible to look at? I mean, it's very different to a, a royal tomb, but the, the art is actually a little bit more refined. Yes, and as you can see, Curtis, there's a lot of yellow here, yes. which is a very cheerful color. But there's blue, blue, which showed this yes. man had money. Yes. Yeah, and you very can see him here. Mm -hmm. He's bowing by the palm with the dates. That's right. And that's so Egyptian. Yes, and it shows um, that he will always have water. Hathor. And Hathor is seen here with her beautiful eye makeup. Let's go into her burial chamber. It's absolutely amazing. Nefertari, the beauty of the beauties. And here is the great queen's royal chamber. Karen, it's beautiful, right? Nefertari, the great royal wife of Ramses II. This is my second time inside Nefertari's tomb. Last year, I left a flower here for Nefertari. This year, because I think she's the most beautiful woman, 
I'm gonna leave her a beautiful peacock feather. So let's give it to Nefertari. She's my favorite. And this tomb, you get to feel a true love story inside here. Her tomb was painted in a fresco style with wet paint being applied to plaster rather than stone and displays some of the finest and most beautiful detail of all Egyptian tombs. The care taken shows not only the love that Ramses had for her, but the love that the workmen who built this tomb for Nefertari shared. She was celebrated for not only her beauty, but her intelligence throughout the ancient world. this extraordinary woman and that her husband, Ramses II, dedicated these beautiful images to the love of his life, Nefertari, who was taken away from him by the age of 30. Princes were also buried in the Valley of the Queens. The tomb of the second son of Ramses III, Ramses III, gave all the sons the same names as those accorded to Ramses the Great or the Second. There's no relationship between the kings, but it's interesting how he wanted to follow, that Ramses III wanted to follow the footsteps of the great Ramses. This is exquisite, all these terms are. Those made for Ramses III's sons have the most beautiful paintings and depictions of the gods and Ramses leading his sons to the gods to ensure the afterlife of his children. The final day of our expedition and we headed over to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo built in 1902 and now houses over 200,000 artifacts. Today we're at the Egyptian Museum. It is one of the most important things that you can actually see here in Egypt. There are thousands of artifacts to see. It's it's one of the highlights and you have to come and see exactly what Egypt has in store. The museum's artifacts range from pre-dynastic times to the late Roman period and some artifacts going back almost 5,000 years. This red granite sarcophagus once belonged to the silver pharaoh of the 21st dynasty, Susenes. Carved inside is the beautiful goddess of the sky Nut, watching over the pharaoh's sleep. Looking at the way in which they made this sarcophagi, and as you can see, the drill marks here show how they cut through the stone to make these apertures. The sarcophagus appears to be recycled from that of Meren Ptah, the son of Ramses II. There is a possible family link. Further down, we see an overlooked part of the Egyptian museum from the 18th dynasty from the reign of Pharaoh Akhenaten. This is a large section of the floor from the palace of the heretic Pharaoh Akhenaten. The new artistic style of the Amarna period is very distinctive, and overlooking the entire museum is Amenhotep III and his great royal wife, Queen T, the parents of Akhenaten. Here we are in the Cairo Museum with Amenhotep III and Queen T. 
Around their feet are their three daughters. There is no sign, of course, of Akhenaten or any of the sons. Usually, princes are not shown on statues with their parents. However, the 18th dynasty of Amenhotep and Queen T were different. It is possible that Akhenaten was left out due to his strange bodily features. This is the Israel Stella, and you can see Melan Ta, the son of Ramses the Great. It is one of the most famous stella in the world. We go around, however, I'll just show you something. This is the Stella of Amenhotep III. As you can see, it's in perfect condition and it's been reused by Marin Ptah for the Israel Stella. Nem Mat Ra. Further up there, it's much clearer. Nem Mat Ra. It's the coronation name of Amenhotep III. Behind me is Queen T, the mother of Akhenaten. She was one of the most important queens in ancient Egypt. And this is a very little known bust of her. Everyone knows the scowling one. But this one, she's actually smiling. Isn't she beautiful? There are many amazing treasures in the Amana room, but the most spectacular is this wooden coffin cladded in gold, stones, and glass. It is the coffin, most likely, of Akhenaten. The face has been damaged, and the name has been taken out, yet underneath it says Son of Aten. Many stela show Akhenaten worshipping the sun god Aten, with his wife by his side, Nefertiti. If you have a look at the stela, you can actually see Akhenaten and Nefertiti here, worshipping the Atom. He is the first monotheist in history. limestone sphinx of Queen Hatshepsut and what's lovely about it is she's painted her eyes are red got the blue on the mane as the lion and it's just absolutely stunning the great Queen Hatshepsut who adopted male dress to be more accepted by the public had many sphinxes of herself made in this form to reinforce her power throughout the land And on her chest is her royal cartouche and throne name, Mat Kara. This intricate granite statue is of Tutmosis IV and his queen, Queen Taya, the son of Amenhotep II, shown with his mother, Queen Taya. Yet, upon closer inspection on the belt of Tutmosis IV, is the throne name of Tutmosis III, Men Kepera. However, on the side of the throne, not in first condition, is the throne name of Tutmosis IV, Keper Keper Menra. Alongside the queen, next to her legs, very visibly is a changed cartouche of Queen Taya. Over here is a little known piece of the mother of Tutmosis III. As you know, his mother was a concubine of Tutmosis II. And because she was dead at the time he received the throne, it was Hatshepsut, the stepmother, who had to come in and become the regent. 
And further along are the treasures of the boy king, Tutankhamun. This is one of four golden shrines which enclose the pharaoh's sarcophagus. This throne of Tut shows him as the sky god Shu, surrounded by falcons and frogs who symbolized eternity. Eventually, all the artifacts found in 1922 by Howard Carter will be moved to the new Grand Egyptian Museum in Giza. Moving the thousands of artifacts will be a very delicate operation. What we're looking at here are these beautiful canopic jars which belong to the army general and the pharaoh, Horemheb. Now Horemheb took over after Pharaoh I. What happened was Tutankhamun tragically died. Pharaoh I, who was, we speculate, part of the family, came onto the throne, but he ruled for a very short time because he was quite old. And then he was succeeded by Horemheb. And Horemheb became friends of Ramses I, and that is how the 19th dynasty came into play with Ramses II. But these are so beautiful of Horemheb, these canopic jars, which would have held his internal organs, but it bears a striking resemblance to Tutankhamun. King Tut and Queen T were the only royals to have been known to use the cobra and the vulture uraeus. Yet, Horemheb's jars show him with the same symbol. So, Sharon, we've just seen yet again the mask for the famous Tutankhamun. We have indeed heard it. What did you think? Fantastic as always. You stood there for probably half an hour examining him. Yes. He's just beautiful. Yes. Yeah. So, Cairo Museum, tick. You've got to do it too. After a good couple of hours at the museum, it was time for lunch at one of Egypt's most famous restaurants, Abu Tarek. They serve one kind of meal called kosheri. <laughs> After the Kemite religion, Egyptians became Coptics, followed by Christian, and then eventually became Islamic. Here we are in Cairo, at the old citadel, and as you can see, Biarton over there, above the old citadel. A lot of Egyptians actually still think that Akhenaten was a prophet, or one god. Akhenaten's forward ways of thinking of one god came almost 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. One could call this mosque modern, as it was built in 1830 by the Pasha Muhammad Ali. Constructed out of limestone and alabaster, it has earned its name as the Alabaster Mosque. Much of the limestone has been taken from the casing of the Great Pyramid of Giza. All the mosques in Islam have to be very simple. That's why we don't put photos or icons, because we don't glorify people in the mosque, it's just the God. Because that's the house of the God for the Muslims. When you're the fair, when you're the king, I'm sorry, you can build as great as you want. And that's why Muhammad Ali is building a really wonderful big mosque. And that's not very Islamic. From inside also, it looks like more, more like a palace more than it is like a mosque. I think the whole idea, he just wants to put himself in. He would just put something to make the people remember him forever. Uh, so that's why he built open court, which is really big, and it's covered all by alabaster. He put a fountain in the middle so the people can wash themselves, because Muslims have to wash themselves before they get inside to pray. One of the most crazy things we have in the mosque is this tower over there, which really has nothing to do with the mosque. I mean, that's a clock tower. And the reason why Muhammad Ali was so proud to put a clock tower in the mosque, because it is not Egyptian, it's French. This is the gift that we got instead of the obelisk that you can find in the place to Concord.
If you think the outside is amazing, the inside is absolutely breathtaking. Built in 1869, this is the Mina House Hotel in the shadow of the pyramids. A glorious place to end our expedition. I just wanted to say something to our tour director, Mary. Mary, you have done an amazing job on this tour. I think this is going to be a great project which will be coming up with more tours. <laughs> I mean, we couldn't have asked for someone more skilled. And, you know, we had Mohammed, who was amazing. Mohammed! <laughs> uh, we had so many great people with us. We had Sharon, who came on a five, five day flight from New Zealand. <laughs> um, and it was just great. She's so knowledgeable. And, you know, you're my dear friend. So, spending time with you has been the most amazing thing. <laughs> and then Alice, oh my god, I mean, what do I even say? You're just, you're just you, you're just amazing. Well, thank you. We yeah. had, I had really a lot of fun on this trip, and you helped make it well, really fun. You were all great. And Karen, oh my gosh, Karen. it was so great to see Egypt through a fresh eyes. Yeah. And your reactions were just so genuine. It was, yeah. it was such, so great. It was wonderful seeing it with you, and it was a wonderful group, um, yeah. and everyone made it special, very yeah. special. We had so many great adventures on this tour. I mean, from Sharon almost killing me inside the Great Pyramid, <laughs> um, making me face my fears. I face the fear now, and that's because of you. So thank you for that. Um, to you guys putting up with my shopping, I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there were so many great things. We had a great time on the Fanuka. There was, I can't begin to describe how thankful I am that I was on this tour with all of you. And Mary, thank you so much for putting up, for putting up with me hugging in Nefertari's tomb. We had a little cry and a little hug. Um, there were so many great things that happened and I just... Thank you, thank you very much guys. <laughs>